Yeah, so the personal finance numbers you should be aware of. These are numbers that relate to your own finances. And this, again, is inspired by the way I manage my own finances. And I'm aware that I do know these numbers off the top of my head. And it makes life a lot easier. Think of it like a an emergency plan. So when you're, you go to work somewhere... They always tell you about the emergency exits or they tell you what you need to do in the event of a fire. It's that kind of principle. You know these facts because you just don't know what life can throw at you. So I'm going to run through some of these numbers. They cover all areas of your personal finances and you will see that they are things that you're probably going to go and have to find out. If you know all of these numbers off the top of your head, you're already aware of them, then fair play, you're doing very well with your finances. Some of these are nice to have, some of them are things that I think you really should know. So I'm going to start at the top, mortgages. Now mortgages seem to be the big talking point at the moment, we mentioned that on last week's podcast. You should know what interest rate you are paying on your mortgage. You should better know that off the top of your head. You should also know what kind of deal you're on, you need to know when it ends you also need to know whether if it's a, a fixed rate deal when the end of that particular deal period, I'm not just talking about the whole mortgage term, when that ends, what age you will be, but also the deal, if you're on a fixed deal, when that ends, you know when you need to be looking to remortgage. You also should know what the SVR, the standard variable rate that you will default onto if you don't do anything about remortgaging. So that rate is normally very high. It will be a couple of percent above the average mortgage rate out there so you should know all of those details you should know your balance of your mortgage it doesn't have to be today it can be each year you're normally sent a statement that gives you all of this information and you should also know any early repayment charges on your mortgage if you've got a particular deal in place typically if you've got a fixed rate deal there'll be an early repayment deal if you try to change that mortgage anyway so for example you try to remortgage now the reason you need to know all those pieces is a very useful If, for example, there was a fundamental change in your life that required you to move, for example, or you might need to remortgage to release some money to be able to help you do something in particular. And those details will already allow you to start thinking flexibly around your options. So find out those details if you don't know them. Another useful one, less important, is the overpayment percentage on your mortgage. So how much are you allowed to overpay before you... incur or invoke any of those early repayment charges so that is your mortgage the next one i would think about is your net and gross pay so you need to find out what your net and gross pay are if you don't know them so most people know their gross pay but do you know what your net pay is and what it should be because a lot of people just accept what comes into their bank account and the reason that i say know your net pay it helps to ensure you're on the right tax code and you're paying the right amount of tax particularly if you're employed so get your pay slip work out what your net pay is each month check it against one of the online calculators if you search paye calculator on google you will find plenty of them and they can tell you what your net pay is and it should match what's on your pay slip the other number i think people should know is their hourly rate of pay now you might not get paid hourly But if you don't, then you can work out what your hourly rate of pay is if you divide what your gross pay is by 2,000. So if you're on 30,000, then that means that your hourly rate of pay, assuming that you're working sort of 35 to 40 hours a week, is around £15 an hour. So that is used. The reason I, I, I think it's useful is in determining value. So if you go and buy something, you go and... Uh, go shopping for example then you can determine how many hours of work you will need to accomplish in order to have enough money to buy that item and that enables you to control your spending somewhat so that's a really easy number to work out but incredibly useful so keeping along the same theme of pay you should know how many weeks sick pay you get so check your contract if you're employed so you know what that is also find out what your statutory sick pay entitlement is it will be 109 pound 40 pence that is statutory sick pay if you're too too ill to work up to 28 weeks we'll put a link in the show notes that explains that in much more detail but that's just to give you an idea so the reason you need to know those numbers is because it helps in the event you might become sick so people don't think about this but work out how you're going to survive which leads nicely on to the next piece about survival funds or emergency funds work out what your total bills are So look at your total bills and then 
think about the fixed expenditure, that's things like mortgages, or it could be rent, and you think about the income you've got coming in, and then you work out the minimum amount of money you have to earn. So if you had to survive because there was a shock, maybe you lost your job, it could be that you're on long-term sick, what's the minimum amount of money you need coming in to be able to survive? And to do this, you need to therefore work out your discretionary spending, so the things you can cut back on, you need to work out maybe the amount of money you might be putting away for savings and investments, so you could actually cut that back if you had to. You'll come down with this number, you need to know what that number is off the top of your head, and then you work out effectively the surplus you've got, so that's your buffer. Once you know that minimum amount, you can then work on building a cash buffer. So you also need to know how much money you've got in your cash buffer at any given time and how many months that could potentially last you for. I know there's different ways of thinking about cash buffers. Some people use gross, like three to six months gross salary. Some people do net pay. Some people do bills. But that is something, if you know that number, whichever way you do it, that's something you should know off the top of your head. Credit score. You should know your credit score. Now, I know there are three different agencies out there, that's credit rating agencies, and they all create credit scores in different ways. And I know there is no universal credit score as such, because every time you apply for credit, the lender you're trying to borrow money from will actually make an assessment about your credit worthiness. But if you check your ratings with the agencies, it gives you an idea of your credit worthiness. But more importantly, if you do check that, then you know you can you are staying on top of your credit report. So if you need to borrow more money for a reason, could be emergency or you're trying to remortgage or you're planning on moving, you now know already that some you're not going to have a, a, a bump in the road or a problem. You're already looking at it. So monitor your credit report. It also means that you will be aware if there is fraud occurring. Or like identity fraud in particular. So somebody might have stolen your identity and taken out loans in your name. That will show up eventually on your credit report and it will also impact your credit score. So make sure you know what your credit score is roughly. More importantly, whether it's excellent, good, etc. rather than the actual number. Make sure you know the credit balances on your credit cards. Now, going back to the previous point about budgeting, we'll put a link in the notes of this episode about how you budget. And it will give you links to articles on the website, but it will help you categorize different spending. You can also use budgeting apps, things like Money Dashboard, things like Plum. They're very good apps at helping you manage your money, but they are also useful, not just for the budgeting purposes on spending, but you can use the apps like Plum or Money Dashboard to help you monitor your balances if you've got multiple credit cards, for example. So you should know at any given moment how much money you've got on your credit cards. It will fluctuate as you spend and you pay it back. But also, if you've got any loans, you should know what loan values they are. But you also should know the minimum repayments on all of those things. And you should also know the interest rate you're paying because then you can start to manage them. And sometimes by having these numbers and knowing what they are, it can help you or it can help galvanize you to make decisions because you start to realize how much interest you're paying then you should also know your overdraft limits as well. If you've got any overdrafts, you should know what they are because you might need to use them. Hopefully you don't, but you might need to use them. But equally, you should know your credit usage. Now, that's the amount of credit you're using versus the amount you've got available. Now, the conventional wisdoms, if you aim between 15 and 25%, that is a good credit usage for your credit report. So that's going to be positive. If you use 100% of your credit limit, then that will be a negative on your credit report. So if someone was going to lend you money, then they're already seeing that you're maximizing your borrowing. It's useful to know these details along with your savings balances for liquidity reasons. So think of it, I mean, we talked about in the office, and it's probably not the nicest way to describe it, but it helps visualize it. It's almost the fund that if you had uh, you're watching one of these hollywood films and you've got a ransom demand how would you get what sort of money could you get hold of quickly without penalty and that includes savings investments that could include things like credit and that number that liquidity number is quite useful to know because if there is an emergency something went wrong do you have access to funds in the short term so you don't really want to 
access them, but it's useful to know that if something went wrong, it's all about flexibility. So I know this number in my head. I know that if something went wrong and the car broke down, I could, how much could I get hold of very quickly to fix a problem that I've got? And you want to keep that number at a decent level. So that's why you have cash buffers and savings. Moving on to pensions, you should know what your state pension age is. It's different. Well, it, it was different for different people. For me, it's going to be age 68. You need to know what your state pension age is. If you want to check, I mean, most people will be 68, but if you want to check, because it does change, you can go on a calculator online and put it in your date of birth, and it'll tell you what your state pension age is. We'll put that in the notes of this particular episode. You should know what your desired pension age is. So when do you want to retire? So when do you want to access your personal pensions? You need to know your employer and employee contribution rates if you're contributed to a pension at work because it's useful to know your percentage contributions into your pensions there's a rule of thumb that's out there it isn't you shouldn't rely on it but if you use your age and you haven't started a pension then they use a rule of thumb that if you take your age and divide it by two that's roughly the percentage of your earnings you should be putting into pensions each month so that means if you're aged 14 you haven't started contributing you need to be putting about 20 percent of your earnings into a pension each month so that is a rule of thumb but you can see if you know those numbers you know how much you're contributing the other thing you need to know is you know when you want to retire you need to know what your retirement income is likely to be so we'll put a link in the notes to the calculators that can help you if you know how much is in each of your pensions you know what type of pensions they are, and you know the date you want to retire and the amount you're putting in each month, you can work out what your retirement income is likely to be. Now, there is always going to be uh, variations in that. There's different factors you can change in terms of uh, investment uh, assumptions, but these calculators are quite useful. We'll put one in the notes of this video. You should know roughly what your retirement income is going to be and what your retirement might look like. It would also help you to know the percentage return that you're planning on achieving in order to get to where you want to be. And the reason I like to know that number is because in years when markets rally and you get them go up, say, 20%, but you get years when they fall 20%, you'll stick to your plan. As long as your long-term annual rate of return is still above what you need to achieve your goal, whether it's retirement or whatever you're saving and investing for, then you know you're on track and it stops knee-jerk decisions being made. So make sure you know those details. Interestingly, we've created an investment calculator at Money to Masses that can help you with working out your percentage you need to achieve your goals in the long run. So we'll put a link to that in the notes because this is all about telling people what numbers they need to know and how they find them out as well. The investments, I think you should know how much you've got in investments. I think you should know the Uh, This counts for pensions as well. What are your charges per year? So taking into account all charges you pay, whether it's for uh, financial advice, whether it's for platform fees, underlying funds, you should know the percentage number that you're being charged each year. Most people find that hard to work out, but if you go on your platform of choice, you should be able to see what you're being charged on each part of your investments, whether that's the platform or the fund. Moving on to the savings rate. You don't need to know this, but I quite like this idea. It goes back to the pension contributions idea. What is your savings rate? So how much are you putting away for your future, whether it's just directly into savings, whether it's into pensions and investments? How much of that is being put into your investment savings and pensions versus what you take home? So you basically work out how much you're putting away and you divide it by your monthly take-home pay and that will give you your savings rate. You should roughly know what that is. And if it's above 10%, then that's good. If it's not, then you probably want to try and get it up as high as you can. Again, you can use that age idea I said on pensions. You can apply it across the board to pension savings and investments. Of course, with savings, you need to know what your interest rate is that you're receiving because you might be being underpaid. You might be better off shopping around. The last ones I'm going to uh, focus on are related to your house. We've done mortgages, but you should know how much equity you've got in your house. You should know what your house is roughly worth. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're not moving, but at least you know what your options are when it comes to remortgaging because you'll need to know what your loan to value is. And I think that ties in nicely. If you take everything I've talked about, you should know what your net wealth is. So you take away all your liabilities from your assets and you should know what your net wealth is. (laughs) 